Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, wherever you may happen to be, and whether you're watching live or archived, and welcome to number, I'm going to throw a dart at the board and say this is number 22 in the Nautel Transmission Talk Tuesday webinar series. Actually, Jeff, Even, it's uh, number 675. Yeah, sure. There's Mr. Disembodied Voice himself, Edward Sylvester, just trying to uh, make stuff up. We have no idea where we are, what we're doing, but we're having fun with it. In the concept of having fun today, we're going to talk about fixing HD. And to do this, I typically try to find people smarter than me. Had two guests lined up for today. We had Mr. Tom Ray. Um, we're going to tell a story about Tom. But uh, in the meantime, not uh, not by any means any least less, we've got uh, Ed Bucant, the uh, owner, PM, engineer, and solutions architect for E2 Technical Services. Ed, welcome. And uh, thanks very much for joining Thank us you. today. Welcome. Uh, so Tom called me about 20 minutes ago, and I guess it'd be closer to an hour ago now. And he said, I have a situation. He said, I've uh, got a customer coming to do due diligence in a couple of hours. And I just stopped by the site to take a quick look and discovered that our four tower array is now a three and a half tower array. Um, so with that, it became the Jeff and Ed show. Now, I did, uh, coming in later, Alex Hartman will join us. He's uh, kind of uh, our backup guy for just about anything that requires an opinion. Alex has opinions. He's not afraid to share them. But, Ed, I think you and I can have a little bit of fun with this in the meantime. Thank you. I'm sure we will. So, standard housekeeping stuff. Um, of course, if you are an SBE member and you're looking at uh, keeping your certification up, first off, if you're not certified, why not? If you are certified, then this does qualify for half of a recertification credit under Schedule I, Category I, sorry, the recertification schedule. So um, go to the shiny new SBE website. I see our president, Wayne Pacinas, in the audience. Wayne, welcome. Glad to have you aboard again. If you have a question, comment, criticism, or concern. Shane Tobin's in the audience. He says he's certifiable, so I guess that qualifies for a lot of us. I mean, this is not an industry you get into with a with a sound mind and body. If, if you got into it that way, you sure don't get out of it that way. Um, now, if you do have a question or a comment, there is the question box in the bottom of your control window. You can absolutely type them in. I will answer them as I see them or wherever I think they fit. If you want to get even more intimately involved, hit the little hand wavy icon there. We'll be happy to unmute your microphone and uh, make you part of the conversation. Sometimes that uh, makes it even more entertaining than ever. We've used the same agenda for every single one of these. I am not going to change this slide. I haven't changed it in 22 slides yet or 675 or whatever the number of today happens to be. As John Van Milligan says, you don't have to be crazy to work here, but it sure does help. So the things we want to talk about, we want to talk about, and Ed, I know you and I were discussing this actually just a few days ago with one you're going to be looking at. Uh, we, were, we were talking about some of the aspects here too. So uh, the, this is the basic list and uh, we'll just sort of put up a slide for a bullet point here and there and uh, have a little fun with it. So first things first, and uh, Ed, uh, we'd been talking specifically about coverage. And the first thing you said, and this was something that, uh, you know, a lot of folks don't think about, but you said, do I need to sweep the antenna? Actually, I don't think you said, do I need to? You said, does your gear have anything on it that will do that for me? Yeah, that's, that was the question, right. So, there have been many schools of thought over the years about how you tune an FM antenna for various reasons. A lot of places that tune it a little higher, so that when ice builds up and it shifts the frequency lower, we don't, in theory, end up with a, a worse impedance. But that's affecting potentially the band pass of your antenna. And that may or may not, in your situation, be a concern or an even greater concern if you start doing things like asymmetrical sidebands. It is important to have an antenna that is correct at your channel. Uh, we saw some of this with the uh, some of the other manufacturers, particularly the tube boxes that were doing HD. We're, we're used to on tube transmitters being able to tune to the load. We generally do not do that in a solid state. Both of the companies, or both two of the companies that make 
an HD2 box will tell you that the transmitter left the factory doing the power it needed, one mega bandwidth into 50 ohms. If you have to tune it more than two cranks of the dial, you have an antenna problem and please turn it off and get your antenna fixed before you void your warranty. This is this is reality. You have to go through your entire system and well, be sure, just as Jeff was saying before, you know, elbows and things. Now, do all the components work at the total power you're going to be using? I guess we'll get into that a little more with one of the other slides, but um, yep. this is a system. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the things the folks are used to thinking about it for AM is when you're going HD, you know, we always talk about the drunken smiley face and how you uh, do a network sweep of your band antenna system from plus minus 15 kilohertz and you should have a curve that, uh, you know, is symmetrical and, and centered at the carrier frequency. And folks don't really think about the fact that FM is no different. The only difference is that plus minus 75 to 100 kilohertz is a much less percentage of 108 meg than 15 is relative to a megahertz or a thousand K. And where this can become uh, important, some folks will say, well, you know, my, my HD, when I turn it on, it seems to impact my analog. The negative impact occurs, not just when you're looking at that dip, but those two sidebands, when they are combined in the envelope detector, have to cancel to not bother your analog, so-called analog FM. For them to cancel, they have to have what we call Hermitian symmetry. They have to be a mirror image. If you have a defect, so to speak, on one side, you have to have the same on the other side. You can't have one slope be a perfect slope and the other have a bump in it. Yeah. So the, you have to even out the imperfections in your system at least. And the other thing that uh, we did, and, and uh, you, you and I had both agreed that uh, this is not one of those hard and fast answer things. So folks, if you're writing down what we say, just uh, put your pencil down for a moment. Um, but people will ask how much injections enough. And my general guide is 20 dB, which is uh, your analog power or your digital power rather is 1% of your analog. 20 dB will light up a translator, but it's useless for any kind of digital reception. Um, 14 dB, where the digital power is 4% of the analog, will give you city grade coverage. It might hit the 54 dBU here and there. Good for close in, for general work, especially if you're in a, a smaller town or something and you don't have anything out on the outskirts of town, no suburbs or anything, then that may be the best solution. And that's what everybody can pretty much run, except for the couple of dozen super bees that have been grandfathered in. Um, and then minus 10 dB, the most that anybody can run, does require a consultant study and an application. It's, uh, you know, that that's a little more in depth than just the notification to tell them that you're lighting up 14. Minus 10 dB in a lot of cases will outperform the analog, but it's very dependent on terrain and what else is in the area. So is, is that what you found to it? So, you know, I don't know, I guess this is going back <clears throat> seven, maybe 10 years into this research. Uh, there were a lot of complaints about the minus 20 did not have the same coverage and particularly did not have the same penetration into buildings and such, which may be true in a lot of cases. But we do know from the research that uh, Glenn Walden and uh, I think some other people who might even be on this call did, and I believe in Los Angeles, at minus 10, we were still able to penetrate down two or three stories into a parking garage in LA and have coverage. And you say, well, that doesn't affect me. Well, yes, it does, and I'll tell you why. Your competition isn't just the radio station across the street. Your competition is also the guy listening to the streaming service, right? And I can tell you from having participated in these studies that I could use my cell phone three levels down at a parking garage to pick up a YouTube stream that I can drive from DC to Baltimore with hardly a dip. And I can't do that with analog FM and I can barely do that with, with HD. So there is a reason that despite the overall costs, 
especially in a competitive market, you may want to try to get that minus 10 because it makes it into the parking garage and so does your streaming service when your analog or your AM may not. Yeah, and I mean, your satellite radio, of course, is gone as soon as you drove under a building cover. So uh, that that's another thing because for us, I mean, if I'm driving somewhere on the highway, I've usually got the satellite radio on. If I'm in town or on the back roads where there's a lot of tree cover, it breaks up enough, I don't listen to it as much. Yeah, well, XM under the serious umbrella has been a whole different joy. Now, let's see. Similar. Okay. Ray Lewis wants to know what is typical coverage loss for turning on RDS versus off? And that's kind of more an analog question, but you're not losing a huge amount of coverage in an FM situation because your power didn't change. Uh, the RDS typically all it impacts is lose two and a half percent on your deviation or half of the RDS injection level. You also have to look at how the HD carriers uh, work. The HD carriers work from the outside in. So until you get to HD three or four, there should be no impact to your RDS or there should be no impact to your analog at all. But if you yeah. find you have to play with your RDS for some reason after having only HD one, two, or maybe three on, something else is going on. Your HD is telling you that you have something else wrong. It's not the HD. And the funny thing about that is that's one of those situations where 99 times out of 100, it will come back to something in the load, whether it's a channel combiner that's short spaced in narrower bandwidth or doesn't have, you know, you got close antennas and you don't have the isolation between them that you thought you did. Uh, could be an antenna that was slope tuned, so your symmetry isn't her mission, you know, and uh, those are the kind of things that you definitely want to look for. If you are putting up an HD system and you want it to Form the best, absolutely get somebody out with a network analyzer to sweep the whole system looking at the transmitter output connector, not just the antenna itself. And, and that analyzer needs to be able to see better than an 80 dB, uh, uh, better than an 80 dB range. Yep, yep, absolutely. All right, moving forward, one of the other things we talk about a lot is MER, modulation error ratio. And this is one of those things that as radio people, we tend not to think about a lot. If there's any TV folks in the, uh, in the audience, I know that MER with DTV is a really big deal. Yes. And because MER typically translates 100% and directly into coverage. Um, the basically modulation error ratio is the difference between what you sent out and uh, what a receiver sees. It's, it's literally the error amount. And uh, the higher it is, the worse you are. So, you know, like if you, and these are negative numbers, so 8 dB, of course, is much worse than 18 dB, as uh, counterintuitive as that seems. But you can see as a dB percentage, the reduction in contour that you encounter as you increase the MER, as, as the MER gets worse. So absolutely, that is something that you should pay attention to. I can't speak for other manufacturers for the most part. I know Gates Air has MER measurement in, uh, in their system. I know that uh, we've got very detailed right down to the carrier, individual digital carrier, MER measuring within the user interface on our HD gear. So absolutely, it is something that you want to pay attention to. And again, as, as we said before, this, uh, this also tends to almost always come back to a load issue, one, one way or another. Um, Somebody, when I posted that, that picture on the right is uh, the station that I uh, play around with in my infinite spare time. Uh, we were at uh, reduced power for the better part of a week because of a fair chunk of ice on it, as you can see. And when I put it up on Facebook, somebody said, oh, look, you can see the antenna the exact moment that the antenna spirit left its body. Um, so <laughs> anyway, uh, that's a... Uh, Oh, let's see. So John John uh, Van Milligan is with uh, Colorado Public Radio. John, eh, I know that you typically have a microphone nearby, so I'm going to click down here and uh, just unmute you. 
And uh, so ERI, and, and it works out well because this is an ERI channel combiner that I snagged a picture of because, and we'll reference that, but uh, you, you said you got a nice wide flat antenna from them. Yeah, so we have uh, the installed, that's about two years ago now, um, two of our stations, one's uh, HD and one wasn't, combined into one antenna. And um, you know, a friend of mine asked, how hard was it to tune an ERI antenna? I says, no problem at all. I just stood there and watched them. But uh, no, they ended up with um, a very nice, I mean, I have... 24 kilowatts going up and I normally have like two watts reflected and it's been in the the sweeps of it the HD station it's nice and wide and flat um, I think no. the analog station has a slight tilt to it but I mean it's so wide how can you really see much of a change right now is that a panel or is it a rototiller and you're combining on the ground it's a uh, um, half-wave space rototiller, and we have a two-station combiner in the in the transmitter room. Okay, very cool, very cool. That's good to know. So thank you for that. And and definitely the load. With, uh, so coverage-wise, how what do you run an injection level on the HD? Uh, we're at minus fourteen. And how's it get out? It does very well. Um, I don't know if we've had a really detailed study done, but I mean, all of our listeners are happy and uh, yeah, it covers where we expect it to cover just fine. Then uh, you're in Colorado. Where's, where's this station located? On Lookout Mountain. Okay. So We're right outside home. of Denver. So it's not exactly what you call flat terrain there by any stretch. Uh, toward the east, it looks a lot flatter than to, toward the west. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Well, thanks very much for that input, John. That's uh, that's useful information. Oh, the uh, definitely there there are a lot of things, and uh, as John mentioned, the the bandwidth, the tuning, um, you can also run into interference situations, and I've seen this where you get uh, two antennas on the same tower. And uh, I, I've run into I ran into one situation where they put one antenna in the aperture of the other. I mean, it's almost like an interleaved antenna, but it's two separate antennas on different tower legs. So, uh, Ed, you ever encountered anything like that? I don't think I've had anything. Uh, I, I had a situation where they thought they had that for a problem, but they were they were not. There wasn't one in the aperture of the other. But they were space combined. They thought they had a problem. They spent a lot of money on fixing the antenna problem, which was really a transmitter problem with another manufacturer. Um, and this goes back to this this troubleshooting thing that we're doing here. You can't make assumptions. Uh, we're talking about even before we get to MER, which is to some degree what what left the antenna and how it got received on the other antenna to some degree. But in theory, we're going to test this stuff into a dummy load before we put it on the antenna to be sure that everything in the building is working. Yeah. If you have a traditional 20 kilowatt dummy load on your 20 kilowatt analog FM transmitter, that's not going to work for testing this. As you start doing the simple math, at minus 20, we're not adding very much power. At minus 14, we're adding some power. At minus 10, the sum of those two sidebands is almost a 50% increase in the amount of power that you are going to be sending to your dummy load. So if you had a 20 kilowatt load, probably better off than just step up to a 50 and make sure you've got some, some uh, headroom. And this is also yeah. true at AM, because I guess we're going to see AM, you know, maybe get some revitalization here now that AM Digital is approved. If you read the back of the Harris manual from the analog AMs, they tell you that for a 10 kilowatt AM, you need a 15 kilowatt dummy load. And, and you do. But at 50 kilowatts of AM, you actually need an 80 kilowatt load. Make yeah, sure your testing environment is right first. A lot of the loads that were sold for AM use were 
were actually sized accordingly. So if you bought a 50 kilowatt AM load, it, it was rated for 75 kilowatts continuous, assuming 100% sine wave. But FM loads, traditionally, we have not done that. So if you buy a 10 kilowatt FM load, it will do 10 kilowatts. And, it, and as, as you said, if you're running minus 10 dB injection, well, that's a, a kilowatt of digital power, but it's four kilowatts of peak-to-peak -peak digital power. So you're running 14 kilowatts into your 10 kilowatt load, and things get a little bit toasty. Yeah, about it's about uh, should be about 50 percent overall between the sum of the two, mm -hmm. like 10. And the the minus 10 works for pattern replication, at least in this stuff we did early on in this. We do not need the same amount of analog power to replicate in the digital world. Yeah. Uh, I've been surprised. I did, um, mount, it was a mountaintop uh, FM in uh, in a, uh, central Pennsylvania. Now I can't quite remember where that was. But anyway, we had a seven kilowatt nominal analog FM transmitter running minus 20. So he had all of uh, 70 watts. I was I was able to pick that up a good two and a half hour drive away. It was still making mm -hmm. it. Um, my own personal experience has been that horizontal and vertical coverage patterns seem to have a bigger impact on HD performance than they did on analog. Yeah, and I've never had that fully explained to my satisfaction, but it has been my experience. Well, and uh, one of the things I ran into, and, and like I say, it, it comes down to, and you'd mentioned it before, the Hermitian symmetry. And for AM, it, it's been a big deal all along. I mean, I like to tell the story about the two five kilowatt AMs I put in back in the day. And on one of them, we put the, we had the uh, load was so flat that doing a plus minus 15 kilohertz sweep, we had to use 10 times magnification on the network analyzer to see more than a dot. So it was dummy load flat. And on that one, when you drove the main lobe, when the HD dropped out, the analog was totally unintelligible. It was gone. Um, another one we had, uh, I mean, Ron Rackley himself, rest his soul, had uh, said that, uh, you know, it, it would cost about a million dollars to linearize the antenna system enough to make HD. So they opted to leave it where it was. It had a 6.9 to 1 SWR on one side band and 4 or 5 to 1 on the other side band. And that one, you couldn't pick the HD up sitting at the base of the main tower. Um, you know, it radiated better in the dummy load than it did in the antenna system. Uh, the the AMs have a particular concern that doesn't seem to show up in FM as much. And that is the difference in phase angle between a particular mm -hmm. transmitter's output, the, the input to an antenna system with its inductive and capacitive load, and the input to a purely resistive uh, dummy load. It yeah. is important if you're going to do this for AM, you need to have a dummy load that has been made to match the input, the, the, the angle uh, between your transmitter and your antenna that you would expect it needs to be matched as closely as possible on your dummy load. And I, and I had this happen with, um, a legendary news station in Philadelphia. And we had already done a DX10, and that had loaded fairly well into the antenna system. We put on a 3DX, uh, a DX50, we put on a 3DX50, and all we did was take out an MW, put in, DX would not load into the antenna if it was into the dummy load correctly. If we got it into the antenna, uh, we're talking the difference of a, a length of three and a half inch line was enough to upset mm -hmm. this thing. So we had yeah, to have well, different matching networks made for the dummy load in order to be able to tune correctly there and have either transmitter. But what mm -hmm. you just said about the analyzer, we did not find this difference using an OIB. We actually found the difference using the AIM-120 stuff uh, that Kintronics now sells. And then it did, like you say, we had to window in pretty hard to find the specific difference. Uh, the OIB said they were both uh, 
within 48 to 52 ohms, and that actually was not correct. Yeah. So the test gear you use does matter. Oh, very, very much. I mean, I had somebody tell me once, they go, your transmitter power meter's off. And I go, well, how are you verifying it? Well, with with this bird watt meter. Okay, when was the last time that was calibrated? Uh, calibrated? And it's like, okay, so, you know, you don't have at that point, yeah, you don't have what you need to do the job. Um, now, Shane Tobin is mentioned, and we're going back to the peak to average ratio, and, and he's mentioned here that that peak to average ratio can really burn you if you don't yes. take it into account. So Shane, I am going to unmute you, and uh, it almost sounds like there's a story here. <laughs> Shane's a good storyteller too. <laughs> Well, I did have one uh, one location. This was uh, at my network in Wyoming, for Wyoming Public Radio. We had a bunch of little 500-watt uh, 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 Class A stations around the site or on the state serving uh, serving local populations. Well, we had put uh, HD on all of those stations. Um, of course, you know, you're talking typical, you know, typical little setups. Some of them actually even just had really, really simple um, transmission line and antenna to them. Well, when we added HD, um, you know, minus 20, it was okay, but we decided to take one site up to minus 10. Um, well, let's just say things started getting a little warm. <laughs> uh, you've got to take into account your, uh, your transmission line, your filter, your antenna. Uh, the whole system, because that uh, that peak energy is uh, it can be quite a bit more than your you know than your average uh, uh, analog TPO. So um, yeah, it's definitely something you need to consider. And I know there are several good calculators out there for that now that'll tell you exactly what that peak energy looks like at various injection yeah. levels. So. Yeah. And the cool thing about that is it is math, and you know the the great thing about math is it pretty much stays the same. So that's uh, that is awesome. Thanks for sharing that, Shane. Now joining us now we have the handsome and talented Mr. Alex Hartman. I think should be here. There he is. So Alex, uh, Alex is late yes. because he's fresh out of a meeting where he's uh, trying to figure out how we can uh, do stuff that we probably shouldn't be doing. But uh, that's kind of where we have fun. Sounds at that. And yeah, Alex excels at that and voiding warranties. Uh, so we put him in customer service where he's in charge of maintaining warranties. Uh, his boss is on the call. John, you really need to reassess that system. But hey, anyway, um, so uh, Alex, uh, I know that you guys especially have dealt with some ice. And I know KVSC has got uh, serial number 0 0.5 of the GV10s. Uh, you got my first GV transmitter as a beta to have it online before uh, NAB so we could bring you up on stage in your uh, underwear and show you how awesome it was. Yep, I remember that very well, including the mud I had to trudge through to get it on the air before I left town, so. That that still uh, makes up some of my presentations on transmitter <laughs> installs. So um, you've had that for enough years Six now. Six and a half years now. I gonna yeah. say long enough for the warranty to be void. Um, does well, ice void after any... 20 minutes, whether or not you, you agree with that, I don't know. So how does the, um, the ice impact, uh, HD coverage, any significant difference that you've seen? Uh, you know, a little bit. Um, yeah, it, it depends on how much you get here in Minnesota. We literally go to, you, it's too cold to snow. So ice when it does happen is actually re relatively rare. Um, but uh, in the fringes, you do notice it because the constellation can't it is the, the visbar scatters the constellation pretty badly on the receive side as well as the transmit side. Um, so it, it is it is a factor, um, but because of the upper and lower sidebands being redundant, it does recover pretty nicely. Um, I think we see maybe uh, maybe a mile of degraded coverage during icing. Um, you know, notwithstanding, you know, the, the power decrease as well, but, right. um, you know, give or take a mile on our fringes. Mm -hmm. Otherwise it's pretty solid. No, um, and I've re never had a problem with it. And to make it that point, I mean, where you are located, you guys are about an hour and a half, give or take west of, uh, mini or yeah, west of Minneapolis. Northwest. Yep. So yeah. we're up a little higher. 
then you've got uh, towns pretty much nonstop between the two. So yeah, that, yeah. that could potentially impact uh, population counts as well. Absolutely. So, uh, that mile range there is about 200,000 people. Right. Now, while, we're, while we got Alex in, I was complaining on Facebook one day not long ago that the worst thing about uh, the, the whole travel restrictions we're going through is that uh, my Casey's General Store travel mug had broken and it's the only travel mug I've ever seen. So shout out to uh, Jake at KRAM in Montevideo for uh, getting me a new Casey's travel mug. I'm well caffeinated today. There you um, go. So one other thing that almost everybody has an opinion on is audio. Mm. So, um, oh, and for those who uh, have never uh, joined us before, um, Ed Sylvester, our disembodied voice, as a uh, photo up and uh, I took it off the cover page, but the first person to guess who that is, there's a swag kit on the way to you. So there you go, figure out who Ed's picture is. Now, back to audio quality. This does not go to 11. No. No, you actually don't want to even get to zero or one That's actually. You, you, want to get, you, want to, you don't want to get, you don't want to get all ones is what you don't want. Right. Just oh, as bad. The big thing, I've run into, and Ed, I know you and I have spoken about it briefly. I've seen some conversations, but uh, you can't run the flat topped half a dB of dynamic range, severely processed audio we're used to seeing in big markets and expect it to sound good. Correct. So, yeah, the, the, the reasons for why we did things that way in analog. Uh, Evolved in some to some degree, they evolved over misconceptions. Um, it came from AM and the idea that you had to squash it to get distance. Well, that doesn't actually work in FM. Some of it was to accommodate differences or limitations in the STL path and get above the signal to noise ratio of 60 or 70 dB, depending upon whose gear, 50 in some cases, and also to make up for limitations in the audio path into the processor. Other noises and things, we were trying to do something with that envelope. But no system operates at 100% all the time. So you do all this compression, and then you end up with overshoots and splatter and stuff. And so we put another box in the chain to deal with that. You end up with six or seven boxes in the chain and a whole lot of AC power strips daisy chain together to deal with this. We have the benefit now, again, going to look at what your competition is, that we can do a lot more with a lot less. One box, properly handling uh, an AES input, and we can go back over why we want to keep this in AES versus analog if we can. But, but handling the processing so that when the listener hears a song, for the most part, out of the radio, it sounds reasonably close to probably something other than an mp3 that they've heard before because your competition isn't just the other radio station it's the other source that someone can listen to that song on and if you sound demonstrably different even though it may sound great in some pair of headphones that you've been carrying around for 40 years it doesn't sound better to the listener and then we go into the difference between how men and women hear if you want your station to sound decent, ask your wife, girlfriend, or I, I'll tell this little story. So I, I played chief of number one station in Washington for several years in DC. And one of our guest DJs walked in one day and everybody liked to show off. We had a fairly decent studio facility. Anyway, he walked in and he was all big and bad and he had his girlfriend with him. And he made a comment about, yeah, the only thing wrong is I wish they turned up the, you know, the, the, the treble a little bit so sound brighter. And she smacked him. She said, I told you, I don't like that. <laughs> and I said, yeah, that's why I'm listening to her, not you. You have to make sure of who's doing the listening before you make the adjustment. Yep, absolutely. Yeah. Um, the, the, the one, the, the, honest, the, the honest truth you will ever hear is an 18-year-old woman who will tell you exactly how your radio station sounds. And yep. that's mostly your core audience, and they have the best ears at this point in their lives. So 
I, tr I take all that with a, a very heavy weight for any audio processing is I set it to what I think sounds okay. And then I'll go over to the college and ask, you know, all the, all the ladies in the, in the station, can you listen to this and tell me what you think using layman's terms so I can interpret that. Yep. And yes. I mean, I know for me, my hearing pretty much stops at about the point that tonight it starts. So around about eight kilohertz, give or take. And, uh, you know, so, yeah, if I have the audio set in the truck, then uh, Real Boss is going to be dialing it down when uh, when she gets in. So, yeah, I, I recently lost the hearing of the flyback in an old CRT. So, <laughs> you know, I can still hear that, but I can't hear voice. So, my hearing, I have a notch in the middle, and I'm still okay at the extremes, which makes it interesting yep. when I mix something. Well, that's it, because then the mid range goes all over. Um, yep. Yeah, Elaine Jones mentions that about 30 years ago, an engineer friend would call her to check on the processing at a station. And, and same deal, you need to do this with different sets of ears in different environments on different receivers. And, you know, try to emulate as much as you can, whatever your core target is. If, if you're aiming at the old, uh, you know, old guy segment, then yeah, you can crank the, uh, the highs a little more. If you're aiming at the younger generation, then you might want to back those down a little. And, you know, that that's the kind of situation you got to deal with. And so specifically with HD radio, the, the one of the favorite pastimes I've always done is we always critically listen on Gentle X, $10,000 reference speakers, you know, $10,000 headphones. Nobody has those listening to the radio. Go to your local car dealership and get a test drive of a 2020 Hyundai. And then listen in there and then go across the street to the Ford dealership and listen to their implementation and then go over to your GMC dealer and listen to their implementation in a different vehicle, you know, truck, car, SUV, they all sound different. If you get within a relatively similar sound stage of these kinds of vehicles, you could probably leave it alone at that point. Yeah. So one of the mistakes that gets made even when you're listening in this proper environment. We all think if we got a pair of, you know, like you say, whatever, a couple of thousand dollar a piece or eighteen thousand dollar a piece ATCs, but at least several hundred dollar a piece JBLs in the studio, we're hearing it correctly. But are you positioned correctly mm -hmm. between the monitors? There are some physics of the distance between from you to the monitor and then the approximately 60 degrees of, of, of angle to your ears and about 56 inches away from the monitor, that is generally the optimum distance that recording engineers will use. And you find if you play with this, you could move your head about a foot either way and create nulls. So mm -hmm. if you have, other than an optimum spacing in your reference point in your studio, you may actually be hearing incorrectly. Exactly. And the car may be, you you have to be sure that your test environment is correct before you tune things to your test environment. Right. Yeah. I mean, in my office here, where I do a lot of audio processing tests, I know that there is a base null right where I sit. Yeah. So, and early on, I was like, oh, there's no base here. So I comp overcompensate for it in the processing. And then I move my head over here and I'm just getting my head blown off. You know, it's yeah. things you have to watch out for. And that's why I say, when you're critically listening on some Gentle X or JBLs or high-end speakers, you are looking for a problem. In a car, no, when you're no. driving down the road, you're passively listening. Yeah. And that's actually where you're gonna hear a lot more of the problems in passive listenership more than critical. And what I tell folks is, uh, it goes back to like the AM stereo days where you had day transmitter, night transmitter, day pattern, night pattern, and you just picked the solution that sounded least crappy on all of them. Mm -hmm. and, you know, you're not making it sound best in any one situation. You're just trying to make it sound less bad in everyone. Right. And so certain much. certain exciters even had a nighttime EQ, which was different from the yeah. daytime pattern. Oh, yeah. You couldn't yeah. pass that through the antenna, though. Even if you did the EQ, the shift right. didn't work. So yeah. now we've done a lot of talk about critical listening. Nobody, I don't think, unless I wasn't listening myself, has mentioned the concept that when we get into the HD2, HD3, or AM HD, we're into the sub 50 kilobits audio bit rates. Average 32. And, Can we back to just a sec from that? Yeah. Because you have it in the slide, and I think this is very important. 
avoid sample rate conversion. Up conversion mm -hmm. is bad. Where you, you can't can. put the bits back you, in. You are never going to go from 32 kilohertz up to 48 and have anything other than 32. You can go from 48 down and still preserve some quality. You know, we this is something we learned more from video, but it does apply to audio and it gets missed. You you take your highest bit rate down, going up mm -hmm. is just a bad idea. And and you know, essentially transcoding going from 32 up to 41, and then from 41 up to 48, and then back to 32 at the other end. Yeah, well, it's just it's, just, it's all asking for trouble. Right. Well, right. As I mean, as you can at the highest rate. And things that, to remember too is like in the audio over IP realm, for instance, uh, Axia, Wheatstone, SAS, Dante, Ravenna, they all operate at 48 internally. Right. So at some point you are going to sample rate convert. So right. if you your house reference television, for instance, their house reference is always 48, uh, if not higher, or 882 I've seen. Um, so they you you can't avoid that in HD because HD inherently runs at 44.1 but mm -hmm. like ed had mentioned you want that to be the last thing you do so your preserved quality all the way from your automation system through your stl and once it hits the importer for the hd2 is where you should have your sample rate conversion right yeah and and again you can convert down you could do 96 to 48 to 44 one with minimal impact but uh, going the other way, 32 to 44, 1, 32 to 48, I mean, it, it's just... You can't yeah, add bits kind of back. Problem. Right. And the other thing, and, and this is kind of last point, one other side note, um, we had William Harrison came close on, uh, on guessing uh, Mr. Disembodied Voice. Haven't had a right answer yet, but uh, we've never had a week with no winner, and I think it's kind of upped his game to make it a, a personal yeah. mission to see if he can continue to or see if he can break that streak. Um, so if anybody wants to throw a shot at the pot, we'll uh, we'll take a look. Um, I did get a Spinal Tap reference and a Sebastian Bach reference, and uh, nope. Um, now, streaming processors. This is one of the other things that I like to beat the drum on. Streaming processors have perceptual coding that is optimized for low bitrate audio. And for your HD2 and HD3, I will argue till I'm blue in the face that you're better off putting a streaming processor in there than the latest, greatest singing and dancing FM processor. Correct. Correct. Because it is a stream. Correct. Plain and simple. It is a stream. Yep. So here's another question. How important is AES Master Clock? And so Alex, you and I ran into this once at uh, one of Denny's stations where the yep. importer wasn't clocked Correct. and it kept dropping out. And I told you, I said, it's not clocked. Well, what difference does it make? It's different audio. Well, it's got to be clocked. And, and right. It, and in HD, there's actually two clocks in play. So, right. you know, the man with two watches never knows what time it is. Uh, we were talking but, about that earlier before you got in with uh, meters. Yeah. So, yep, same yep. deal. So, you know, the, there's a clock for the audio to keep that in check, which you don't want that to drift at all. Uh, mm -hmm. That's why the GPS is involved and stuff like that. And then there's the constellation clock on the RF to keep the RF in check, which is usually yep. disciplined by a 10 megahertz reference. Mm -hmm. So that's why in, in like our multicast product, for instance, everything is disciplined to that GPS, the audio, the transmitter, the exciter, everything. That way they don't have a chance to move around and they're all clocked together. Now, the commonplace becoming is that things like the multicast are living at the studio separate from the transmitter, mm -hmm. where the GPS is in that one unit. <laughs> so how do you discipline your transmitter? Well, you, you still need some kind of timing reference. Um, the current HD platform does clock over ethernet, but if you're using that IPSTL uh, for multiple things and it's a chatty network, you can throw mm -hmm. that clocking off pretty horribly. And you yep. will get those dropouts. Right, right. So that is uh, something to uh, to pay attention to. Go ahead, Ed. And then this is why. Uh, how do I say this delicately? So we we have managed to keep the analog world running in radio for probably fifty years longer than it needed to. And mm -hmm. the reality is whether. Station owners want to hear it or not, and Alex is smiling, so maybe he knows where I'm going with this. Everybody else has a GPS master at every point in the chain. 
you're going to have it at the studio, you're going to have it at the transmitter. You want to make there there are times when it may not have to be a GPS master and it can be a so-called arbitrary master, but there yeah. does have to be a clock at each point in the chain. And for the best performance, it should be a GPS clock. Yeah. Or you're 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 going to have problems that you could have solved. Right. Now, Even I haven't the said that. Watchmakers I'm, can't carve a crystal that is one ppm accurate over 20 years. No. I mean, even a reference oscillator, which still sells for somewhere into the high six figures, you're uh, you're mm -hmm. you're going to have some amount of change. Now, Aaron Hume made a good comment going back to streaming processors. Uh, so they they've got uh, our gear with the HD multicast, and I love the HD multicast because it's a big honking computer with lots of room to put stuff. And so you're not limited like you would be with a purpose-built box. And in Aaron's case, they're running a stereo tool internal to the HD multicast to process their HD2 and HD3. So, uh, you know, again, stuff that's optimized for with the perceptual coding. It, it's just a, a great thing. By the way, uh, Chuck Dubay did get the uh, the guest. That's uh, David Gilmore from Pink Floyd. So um, I uh, will confess that... Uh, I thought it was Eddie Van Halen, and uh, really, that, uh, I, I thought know, it was Michael man, Jackson. I'm turning in my heavy metal hair band card now, but uh, but that that's well, it. There is a striking resemblance to very early Lars Ulrich from Metallica, however, early okay, eight. Well, well, we'll we'll go with that. But no, so Chuck, <laughs> uh, absolutely swag kit coming your way, and Ed, you, sorry, your uh, your no win streak continues. You're going to have to up your game. <laughs> Now, the other thing we talk about a lot in HD, and this is, I, I call it the, you want to call it the, the beast in, under the bed, so to speak. Um, it's probably one of the biggest complaints we get is wandering delay. And I've seen it in situations to a lesser extent with our gear if it's all sitting in the same room. But I've seen folks say, you know, depending on who they've got, and this comes back to what Ed was talking about with the clocking. If you don't have a GPS sync, then this thing's running on its internal 10 meg oscillator at this frequency, and this thing's running at its 10 meg oscillator at that frequency, and they're not tied together. So they will go all over the place. Um, so clocking is important. Uh, there are what I call pills. There are solutions like Gates Air has got the, uh, you can pick up the receiver and uh, and uh, collect the, or correct the delay in their exporter, and that's cool. Anavonics. Um, Anavonics has the Justin 808 uh, with uh, receives and auto corrects the delay before it sends it to the uh, to the equipment. So, you know, there are some things like that. We're going to talk about uh, the new shiny thing that uh, we've been playing with in a second. Um, Shane, yeah, so Shane just mentioned that uh, lab configurations were all the gears in the same room. And uh, I think the we all clocking have to is, throw it to the real world. Right. Well, clocking is the most critical thing. And I mean, if you're in a situation where you've got the importer and exporter at one end of the chain and the transmitter in the transmitter site at the other end, you almost need to clock them both. Yep. Um, the yes. other thing folks don't think about, and I've run into this a lot, is they'll um, put in an HD system. They were running, say, a 8100 on their analog before, so they'll buy an Omnia 1 or whatever to process the HD 1. And the two audio signals are not synced together in any way. There's no AES. Well, there is. There's two AES okay. clocks, one for that signal, one for that signal. So, of course, they are going to be wandering. They're going to be at different bit rates. And depending on your processing you do, including the difference between FM and HD1, which is pre-emphasis, they may come out of the processor at different times. Mm -hmm. And that's uh, where the challenge starts coming into play. But a lot of people are still trying to take, they're trying to keep analog in the FM chain and only do digital. And uh, as, as much analog and to some degree even composite as you keep in that analog chain, you will have wandering even if you have the clock at one end, if you, for some reason, still have analog imaging, you're going to have a problem. 
And a lot yep. of these STL solutions that were deployed um, several years ago now, because they're, they're, let's face it, they're expensive systems. A lot of mm -hmm. those are unidirectional 950s or ISM type right. of unidirectional links. Right. So you, the data can only go one way, you know, yep. so you can't say, hey, I've, I've got a problem here. I need you to resend that. It, it, it's just going to keep okay. blasting and blasting and blasting. So it's just mm -hmm. trying to play catch up the entire time. Yeah. Because when you have so, packet, you know, packets have timestamps. That's mm -hmm. why we can get this, even even if it's not per se AOIP, mm -hmm. that it has a packet, it's going to have a timestamp. Something at the receiving end is going to be filling up a bit bucket and, you know, time. But even when you have that, every solution also adds a bit of delay. So yep. if you start taking a Justin and an importer and exporter and a processor and you because we can do that. We can well, we can have all three of the compensations in there for whatever mm -hmm. reason. Um, but every solution also has some delay. So you have to be careful sure. about putting a box in the chain. Right. What if you even use satellite delivery? You got time of flight up and down from the sky. Yeah, I mean, the good thing about it is once we passed uh, 18 milliseconds, which we did the day we turned on HD to begin with, uh, listening live became a non-issue. So... Uh, so right. that's that's the challenge. Um, John Huntley makes the ask the question: What's the cost difference to add the GPS reference at all sites, both in uh, dollars and percent project costs? Uh, so percent project costs, I can't answer that because if you're looking at a VS two and a half HD, it's going to be slightly different project costs than a GV forty HD or a Flexiva forty or or or. So you know, in that regard, I can't give you a percentage. GPS reference, you're basically looking at a GPS receiver and antenna. You can get one from ESE, even with our markup, it's $1,500 or less. So we have a separate GPS uh, receiver option for four grand. There's so, another yeah. one, and I can't remember its name off the top of my head now. It's only like 750 bucks. It's like time, time machine. machine. Yeah. Time machine. That'll give you right um, there. <laughs> you have to be careful of this. Um, those who are using Dante at some point in their chain, Dante uses PTP version one, which mm -hmm. has all sorts of issues. Everybody else almost is using PTP version two. Yep. And so if you have anybody else and you put some of these inexpensive clocks, you need to be sure that if you're gonna have Dante in your world and that Dante is not AES 67, that your master clock does both version one and two. Otherwise, yeah. you can probably get away with just version two. So yeah, for 700 bucks or so, you could solve your studio problem. And almost all the HD products do come with the GPS receiver built in. But the question is, can I mount that antenna? You know, mm -hmm. it's got to be outdoors, or at least close to a window that sees a bunch of satellites. How long is the cable run? All of those sorts of things can be an issue. Right. Well, on GPS, I mean, antenna, once uh, the stock antennas typically come with a 50 foot cable, as you start right. to add antenna length, you're obviously adding delay, you know, right. as well as the uh, and, uh, GPS. I've seen a lot of folks who will run one antenna and then uh, run an eight way splitter and run a boatload of GPS receivers off it. It's and I'm actually just dealing with I've been dealing with an issue ongoing out in Colorado. Uh, with a, the similar issue where the multicast is at the studio facility and they're using a, an MPLS VP, uh, MPLS circuit to get to multiple transmitter sites uh, with a VLAN on it. And it's chatty and it's noisy. So they don't have a GPS on the transmitter site because the GPS is in the multicast at the studio. Mm -hmm. Well, he's getting, he's getting a lot of frame drops and, and the X-Gen going out of sync and stuff like that. Because when you don't have a reference clock installed to discipline the transmitter, they free run. And yep. then they set themselves to whatever clock they do have available. Well, in this case, it happens to be the network jack. Mm -hmm. um, and it's not 1588. It's just straight up Ethernet frames. Yep. So if you drop a packet, miss a packet, you missed a clock cycle. Just the same. Right. Yep. So Shane Tobin makes another good point here that lost packets equals delay drift. And that's true in both the HD data and in AES audio, as far as that goes, because when you lose packets- That's a big chunk. Yep. And that's another, uh, I don't know. It's a technical point that we probably have to be aware of more going forward. 
these timing and packet issues and, and the time stamp on packets is a function that occurs at the network interface, not in software and application. Right. Um, that's more critical for video, but it is something we have to be aware of. Well, and now it's getting more and more critical with, um, you know, HD fed translators, boosters, yeah. SFN experiments that are happening around the country. That is a critical timing mechanism now. Um, mm -hmm. Like you said, you mentioned Time Machines just came out with uh, a couple of months ago, uh, their new product, which is a, their high end at 750 bucks. It's a GPS referenced PTP and 10 megahertz clock for 750 yeah, yeah, US yeah. bucks. Cool. You really can't argue with that price. No, that's about half of what you've been seeing anywhere else. Yeah, so yeah. I, that's know. what I've been telling people. If you if you are doing a separate importer exporter at the studio with a transmitter, yeah, we make one, but here's one that works with a 10 meg ref, plug it into the transmitter. It doesn't matter the transmitter, you know, it could be a, a Gates, it could be a Nautel, it could be anything. Um, there's, there's a and make reference that's GPS disciplined, and that's what you want on every end. And, and the and the discipline is an important word too, because it 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 refers to how we take uh, our reference and and structure it to be put onto the network. There are different ways. I mean, PTP itself is a whole another clear for reference, but uh, there is a perception out there that. This HD stuff is only made by one or two vendors, and it's all very expensive, and you sort of have to write them a big check. And that's really not true. There is a limitation maybe on the transmitter end because they're so darn expensive to research and build. But overall, the audio over IP world, and these standards and the clocks and all, there are at least 15 different vendors out there offering prices from 750 to probably 750,000. You got to okay. dig deeper. And broadcast is actually a small component. It's very okay. small. Wall Street mm -hmm. uses this. The electrical power grid uses this. The um, data the centers. Who teach data centers, of course. But the fellow, I can't remember his name now, who teaches the uh, Cisco classes for SMPTE and the um, Cable TV uh, Association. Uh, he tells an interesting story about ptp and clocking and all that for wall street we think we have tight constraints at wall street they want to know who pushed the enter button last to to uh, accept a trade and that has to be mirrored in real time at the backup yeah. data center that's in new jersey right so, at the uh, the, the fun server. part is i was just watching a video on spacex's new starlink system and comparing it to the AC1 cable, and then there's a private cable right next to it going across from London to New York, specifically for the stock exchange, it was worth $300 million for them to drop their own undersea cable to shave off 20 milliseconds of latency. Yeah. Did you see this? There's another similar, there's a company that wanted to emulate the accuracy of, of, of trades, and they actually have in their lobby, what is it, 10? thousand miles of fiber wound on a spool yep. so that they could emulate the delay of someone in new york hitting an enter key it bouncing off of somebody in california and coming back to wall street right this wow. is not jump change anymore what we're doing these yeah, are no, real standards based a, systems the old at&t long lines tower there's one half a mile from my house here they're lighting those things back up because they're half a millisecond faster than fiber to get into Wall Street. Yep. So we're a small player here compared to that world and the mm -hmm. way where technology has gone with timing. But you know, a lot of people think that these are things that we just sort of dreamed up. All all of the flavors of audio over IP and so and the protocols that we use here over a network, these are all based on standards. There may yep. be variations in how they're well, implemented. The thing goes, radio is 20 years behind the times, which means the technology is just the same. I mean, we, we all grasp onto SNMP. When I was doing IT full time at, at enterprise level ISP in 1999, we were trying to get rid of it. We didn't like it. We wanted active. We wanted active clients. You know, because polling yeah, didn't I, work. <laughs> and that yeah, was 1999. Something that needs to also be noted, um, 
there are those who feel that we are at a disadvantage when we do HD puts the analog at a disadvantage. Because we have to go to the class A amplifier rather than the class C biased, we're not only linearizing, linearizing the amplifier for the HD, but also for the analog. You can improve your analog stereo performance by going to HD without having to even buy a fancy HD processor because it's linear yeah. and we're going to reduce our AM noise issues and our, and our group delays and, and everything else. I have mm -hmm. never had a program director tell me to take the HD off because the analog sounded worse. They always right. notice that it sounds better. Yeah. Now, one thing, uh, talking about uh, syncing and location, Alan Jerison has mentioned that our NRS CG203 recommends the importer be co-located at the transmitter. And mm -hmm. no question that that is the best way to do it. Um, and he says, if you can't do this, uh, he found an oscillator that uh, most closely matches the Nautel Exporter Plus. Uh, do, 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 do. Alan, I'll tell you what, I'm going to have Ed put the link up in the um, chat for anybody that wants it. But uh, I'm going to unmute you. Tell me a little bit about this, if you could, uh, assuming you've got a microphone handy. He's, um, he's correct. Can you hear me now? Absolutely, loud and clear. All right. So yeah. Um, so one of the problems that we've been following is is that um, every product that every manufacturer's made in broadcast use until generation four use different types of GPS oscillators, even in the same vertical profile. So um, Nautel did this, uh, Gates Air did this, BE did this. So the GPS reference oscillator that's been in the exporter is not the same thing that is in um, you know the transmitter and in different port parts of the chain. So what we found actually is um, you know a lot of people were saying oh if you split split and put the uh, you know the exporter back at the studio because a lot of people like that, which is something the NRSC strongly dis discourages. It's really not the best thing to do. But if you have to have it back there for X, Y, or Z reason, um, you know people were going out and buying uh, you know one thousand, two thousand dollar. Uh, 10 megahertz uh, GPS reference oscillators and you know you can get an ESE for about a, you know the thousand dollars or fifteen hundred dollars we're pretty familiar with those um, we even went and did a lot of research and spent more money on like uh, lab lab grade uh, equipment like uh, two thousand or three thousand dollar GPS reference oscillators great but the problem is is the 10 megahertz that comes out of those that goes into the transmitter is not anywhere near what of, of, of it, it's, it's much more precise than what is actually in the exporter so we found, um, at least with the Nautil Exporter Plus, uh, which is what uh, we standardized on in 2012. Uh, so I've got 405 of these. I know, okay, watch them quite well. Um, for the few that we still have at the studios, that the time alignment's uh, moving all over the place, don't go spend $1,000 or $700 on, on a GPS oscillator. Uh, you know, first of all, if you're going to spend time cleaning up the air chain and you have a bi-directional air chain, uh, the best thing to do is actually spend your time moving the exporter up to the transmitter site. But if, if it still needs to stay back at the studio, um, this link that I have here, there's there's these uh, cheap knockoff, uh, uh, you know, uh, 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 GPS oscillators that run about $160. You can find them easily on eBay. And uh, we've got them working at a bunch of sites where, where the exporter uh, is not co-located. In fact, we actually bought a lot of them recently for TV repack auxiliary sites because we decided to do one single exporter feeding the main site, uh, you know, co-located and shooting the E to X over to the uh, the TV repack site. So this was our answer of, of solving that. Again, 60, uh, $100, $160 solution. And, uh, you know, you can run multiple stations off of it as well. We've got, you know, at our TV repack site in LA, we got four stations running off this $160 box. Works really darn good. Not as good as having the exporter right next to the transmitter, but pretty darn good. Excellent. Well, that's excellent. Uh, I have a couple on. of those too, Alan. They are really nice little boxes for what they, yeah, they are. They match. They match well for what we're doing with it. You yes. Know, if you're doing lab yeah, The accuracy is there for sure. Yeah. Yeah. It, you know, it just the, the the problem is is the the lab grade equipment that the manufacturers were telling yeah. us to go out and buy was just too darn precise. <laughs> and uh, so well, you, know, they don't, have. you can actually you will. We actually a long time ago when we started looking into these signals and stuff about five six years ago. You know, we, we did a lot of research about the different waveforms and, and, and literally, as I said, even within the same manufacturer, um, the waveforms are all different. Um, the peak to peak voltages, whether it's a sine or a square wave, 
all the 10 megahertz that we're using, we, we consider it kind of genericized 10 megahertz, but they're all electrically very different. The very electrical so. interface specs of what the output is and what the input is, is, is different. And we kind of found, at least with the Nontel Exporter Plus, this, this really uh, not, uh, uh, narrowed it down. I don't know how it works with the, yep. with the Multicast Plus and uh, the HD200, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't spend a lot of money on it. Again, if you're going to spend a lot of time on it, if you already have bidirectional connectivity, the best thing you can do is get that exporter up there and, and just direct clock it right off that exporter yep. because then, then you know you have the, literally the exact same reference oscillator. Right. Right. Excellent. Well, thanks very much for that, Alan. Uh, we're running close to the top of the hour. I have asked um, Ed to uh, put a copy of the, the link Alan posted for the uh, oscillator in question up. If he doesn't get to that before we run out of time, just uh, send me a link. It, it, it says it's done. Well, there you go. I guess I should actually be paying more attention to the chat myself. And uh, just and, just a clarification, you might have had it, it's it's very easy to get this uh, all confused and stuff like that. But um, we the NRSC recommends the exporter at the transmitter site. The importer really can go in either in either side as long as you have bidirectional connectivity. That really does yeah. not impact your 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 time alignment and your HD one. Right, the exporter is responsible for the HD one, which yeah. makes perfect sense why it would have to be the best place for it is next to the right. transmitter on the shortest as, table possible. Yeah, but as we move into combined boxes in Generation yeah. Four hardware, like the Nautel Multicast Plus or the Gates Air or the Roden Schwartz product, that's you know all mm -hmm. in one box. Yeah. It's best to have the consolidated importer exporter at the transmitter site. Right. Absolutely. And same reason. I mean, the importer is irrelevant, but the exporter at the site is yeah, just going to yeah. be a that, whole. That, that's the reason why it's like that. Yeah. And, you know, and, maybe, and maybe long term, maybe long term that can be fixed, you know, in generation five, so to speak. We're, mm -hmm. we're you know, we're, we've got a variety of teams looking into that. But, you know, that's several years down the road. And right. yep. the reality is, is there's, you know, 66 plus million receivers out there uh, out on out on the roads. You know, I call them mm -hmm. receivers, radios with wheels. <laughs> and uh, people, people are listening to these things and when when your when your time alignment or your hd1 audio quality is off people do do hear it and in some markets uh, like new york and la and miami i mean it's more than one in three cars registered on the on the road to have have hd radio now yeah absolutely right. so that's uh <laughs> that, that's to, some oh, go ahead hey you can go um that was milwaukee i did a uh studio project in and so these weren't really radio people involved. I was there to do the Axia part of something, but it was a bunch of other people. But anyway, every time that we rented a car, um, the AV integrator was responsible for it. They always had the, the radio on and they had the HD up. And I would ask them, you know, about things like that, you know, blended and all. They don't really notice that. They just notice when there's a problem. They, you cannot right. really get good feedback they're just going to turn it off and go to something else if it's not right that's correct yeah and then you know again the big thing with why you want them to be very precisely aligned and have uh, have them even sound you know there was a little talk about it earlier you, you unfortunately we have to bring a lot of the bad analog things we do into the digital mm -hmm. domain because you don't want them to be strikingly different um we've got right. a lot of complaints and a lot a lot of our research and diversity delay research the last uh, five years you really want the uh, the FM and the HD one to be the same level and and have the same uh, consistency because what, remember they're not just blending once it's not just when they turn on the radio in eight seconds and then they leave your right. coverage area there's a lot of people that bl are blending in and out and blending in and out and you yeah. know it, you we, hit a high we didn't think we didn't area. yeah, we, yeah. We, we we as an industry failed or we we thought too much about those snail trails we saw in 2005 you know there were those maps mm -hmm. oh this is your coverage area and especially if someone lives uh, lives and or works in you know if you're at minus 20 and they live between the 60 dbu and the 54 dbu contour there's actually a blend count in the radio that you know it's never presented mm -hmm. to the consumer but those 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 numbers in a in an average listening session could be you know in the dozens um, you know, well, I've, I've, I've seen them even at, at some of our studios, we monitor it with some of our stuff. And if it's a fringe signal, I mean, over 24 hours, like the, the radio may have blended 150 times. Well, and of that, course, you can't account, for, you can't account yeah. for certain things like environmentals. You know, I've, yeah. I've, I've mm -hmm. had that. Uh, one thing that no one ever considers, and I've experienced several times living on the outskirts of Minneapolis, driving 75 miles an hour up the interstate towards home away from the towers, Doppler effect is actually a problem on the fringes. You are outrunning the packets. 
<laughs> 70 well, again, miles an hour. It's, it's, it's by me again? Oh, oh, the patent says delivered. Yeah, to, you're going receive. faster than the radio yes, can receive them. Yes, yes. And, and then yes. the other side of that, too, is that we as an industry are now just really focusing in on this diversity issue. And we've done a three-part webinar on what we've come up with at Nautel, and I'm sure everybody else has one stuff like that. Um, <laughs> on how this is all proposed to deal with. If you got three hours of your life, you wanna go and learn some really cool stuff, go watch our webinar on that. But yeah. the, 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 the other side of it too is, we as an industry have taken it to the fourth generation to start dealing with this problem. The receiver industry has been angered by it for so long, they took matters into their own hands and late model vehicles have diversity and time alignment receivers built into them. So now we're playing chicken and egg and catching our own tail. Yeah, well, and that, that's where you start to get yeah, into, like, the, the original dueling algorithms challenge. Exactly. That, and nobody Alex invited the broadcasters to the that. table, <laughs> so we didn't even know about it. Yeah. I mean, we, if we don't modernize, it's, it's, if we don't catch up to the modernization going on in the rest of the world, we're not going to be part of the rest of the world in the future. We can't. Their GM slogan in the 90s was right. GM so, General Motors in the 90s had the best slogan ever lead, follow, or get out of the way. But it's that's been my say true. since the 80s. <laughs> and you know, I remember people when Nissan was really stepping up their sales efforts here, you could buy a Nissan that had no radio or an FM. It did not have an AM section originally. There was a, it was, they added the AM back in when some people complained. Mm -hmm. uh, so we on that have, note, we are. 15 minutes past our allotted time, folks. And oh, I know we can talk nice. about forever, yeah. but uh, you know, we, we don't want to, don't want to, I mean, I know folks got stuff to do. So standard resources, uh, this webinar course is recorded as are all our webinars and anything where I think that we might actually say something not too incriminating. And uh, you can find those on the webinars tab on our website, or you can go to our YouTube channel. The good thing about the YouTube channel is uh, customer service does their fancy little, uh, their, their fancy little um, how-to videos on, on little short notice things like how to put the uh, rack sides together for your VS transmitter, which is- Testing a PA, the, my favorite. Testing a PA, another good one. Um, we've got our Waves newsletter. One just came out a week or so ago. So on that note, I want to uh, give special thanks to Ed Bucant and, uh, and Tom Ray in absence for not being able to make it up, but for agreeing to be here, even if he, did have a, a situation come up. So Ed, thank you very much for coming in. Okay. Alex, I want to thank you for bailing me out when I called you like five minutes before webinar time and said, hey, what are you doing in about 10 minutes? And uh, <laughs> thanks to your boss for letting you play with us. Although I see John's already gone, so he didn't catch that, thank you. He'll have to catch it on the recording. On that <laughs> note, folks, I want to thank you all very, very much. Have a wonderful week and we hope to see you next week. Bye now.